Thank you. In the early 1900s, there was a young man who came to this country from Poland to flee pogroms and persecution. That man's name was Abraham Lepofsky. And he came here to start a better life. He had no money, no job skills, and a limited education. But he came here so that he could improve the life of his future children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren. I am Abraham Lepofsky's youngest grandchild. I talk about Grandpa Abe. Now I want to fast forward to 2011, and I find myself doing a job interview workshop in Phnom Penh, Cambodia, for 20 young adults. They are um, in their home as I give them their lesson. Their home is an orphanage where they have spent most of their lives. Like Grandpa Abe, they have no money, no job skills, and a limited education. And at first, I was uncomfortable. I was self-conscious. I thought I had a lot. They had nothing. And all of a sudden, I had this like clear and prophetic moment when I thought that they were very similar to Grandpa Abe. Just as he had fled persecution, they had also, their country had gone through something traumatic. In the 1970s, there was a genocide in Cambodia where 3 million people died and now where 56% of the population is under the age of 25. Suddenly, when I looked at these young adults, I realized I was looking at the faces of Grandpa Abe. And I envisioned these adults suddenly as older adults changing their future generations, making the lives of their children their grandchildren and their great-grandchildren to be better. And suddenly I realized I was like their proverbial grandchild. That in fact, when I looked at them, I realized that they were that future that I was already living. That in fact, we had greater similarities than I had ever even expected. So the Cambodia of today is still rebuilding. And the Cambodia of today is the home of Angkor Wat. It's the largest temple complex in the world. And it's where millions of tourists come and travel. And where there are tourists, there are hotels. And where there are hotels, there are jobs. A former student of mine, Ben Justice, only 22 at the time, recognized this opportunity to offer hospitality training skills. And he started a nonprofit school at the orphanage where I was that day. And he named that school Eggbach. E-G-B-O-K, and it's an acronym, and it means everything's going to be OK. And that phrase came from his grandfather, Pops, who signs his letters that way. And now Eggbach is five years old, and we have a freestanding school where our students learn hospitality skills, and we're about to break ground in a cafe so that our students can learn experientially while offering a memorable experience to the international tourists who are going to become our guests. So my career has entirely been in hospitality. I've always focused on trying to make people feel comfortable and welcomed. It's what I call living a hospitality mindset. It's about having a heightened awareness of what other people need so that I can go ahead and calibrate my behavior to be able to offer the needs to those individuals. This is not a job. This is a lifestyle. It's about looking at opportunities where you can actually be of benefit to someone and they don't even realize that you're doing it, but they realize that something good has happened in their life. There's a saying in Cambodia. It's same, same, but different. And my message to you is same, same. Whether or not I'm talking to the egg box students who are going for a hospitality job in hotel housekeeping, if I'm coaching college students and being positioned for their first summer internship, or I'm offering training to the staff at the offices of the president of the provost here at Cornell University. It's universal in the way in which we treat people, no matter who they are, no matter where we may encounter them. So how do you start doing this? Well, I want to show you an activity that I did with these students in 2011 at the orphanage. And I want you to imagine somebody that has a generosity of spirit, someone who's kind, someone who's thoughtful, someone who acknowledges and appreciates other people, someone that when you're with them, you feel good about yourself. And now I want you to think about what does that person do that inspires that good feeling in you? And then how can we have our behavior inspire those same positive feelings in other people? 
So I gave this to these young adults, and they got it. They understood. They started to have a heightened awareness of how to act with people around them. So that was step one. But I want to offer you a step two in creating a hospitality mindset. Take all those attributes that I just referred to. But now I want you to think about somebody who in your life, when things weren't feeling very good, stepped into your life and made a difference in your life. They stepped in and made you feel better about yourself. Now imagine if you went ahead and you emailed them tonight. And you said that this person challenged you to think of somebody who, when things weren't going well, they made a difference and that you had thought of this individual, that they had made a difference in your life. So the research on happiness shows that it's these small, positive events that occur between people that really provide us with the most well-being. But if you really want to give somebody hits of happiness, and who wouldn't want to give people a gift of hits of happiness, is for you to buy a card that person will like, write the message in the card, put a stamp on it, put it in the mail, let them go through their pile of junk mail, and suddenly they're going to find this beautiful, lovely, handwritten note that says that message that we just referred to. You know what's going to happen? They're going to read that note. They're going to reread that note. They're going to put that note on the refrigerator door. They're going to put it on their desk. They're going to put it in the bureau drawer next to their bed. This is where I keep those sweet notes. And I tell you, it does wonders when I'm not feeling my best. This is how you can provide that courtesy and those little moments of happiness. But also, research shows that the pain neurons that get triggered when you break a bone are the same neurons that get triggered when someone is ignored, diminished, and marginalized. Think of a hotel housekeeper. Think of a restaurant worker. Think of people who can be invisible, people who have an existence, but they're non-existent to the people around them. And just what would happen if suddenly you gave them a friendly nod, you gave them a warm smile, and you break through those walls of anonymity and shift someone from being invisible to suddenly being present and acknowledged by another individual. This is the kind of courtesy that I am talking about that we can do for one another. We all dish out indignities. We don't intend to, but we're so absorbed with our lives. We're checking our phones for text messages. Guilty. And we don't pay attention and look up and look around us. And sometimes when I do go ahead and look up and look around me, I realize that I am wildly inappropriate, and I suddenly make these first impressions on people because of the way they look. I am more a cautionary tale than I am a role model. And I need these constant reminders to myself that my first impressions may not be correct. And I'll give you an example just last week. I have examples that can go on. They happen every day. So last week, I was in New York City, and I get onto a subway. And a subway is like a microcosm of humankind, right? Human behavior, good, bad, strange, can occur in a subway car in Manhattan. So I sit down, and all of a sudden, the door is open, and Mr. Hipster walks in. Hipster van walks in. The kind of guy that's got the big bows, headphones on. He's got the fashionable faded ripped jeans. He's totally engrossed in the screen of his mobile device. And he sits down and just stares at it. We get to, and I peg him, arrogant, self-absorbed. We get to the next subway station. The door is open. And this older man, severely hunched over, really leaning heavily on a cane, slowly gets into the car. Without missing a beat, without even looking up, Mr. Hipster Man rises and gives the older gentleman his seat. They look at each other, they acknowledge each other silently, and seamlessly and immediately, this wonderful gesture of courtesy occurs and unfolds. What do I want to do? Mr. Hipster Man is now Mr. Hero. I want to find his mother, tell her she's done a great job with her son, and I want to also apologize because I was so wrong about his first impressions. And you know what? We make these first impressions, and they're immediate, and they're subversive. And we don't give ourselves that time to get more information so that we can have a better judgment of someone. And while we are making judgments of other people, they are making it about us, sometimes good, Sometimes bad, sometimes startling. So the next day, I get back onto the subway car, and it's packed, and a young man rises to offer me his seat. I am that old, frail man leaning on the cane in his eyes. I don't particularly like this perception, but do I take the seat? You bet I do. <laughs> and I know that I always try and find a silver lining in no matter what the circumstance is, particularly if it's in a packed subway car in New York City. But there's a bigger message, and that really is about our first impressions. 
and that if we think about seeing somebody and we think about our own life experiences and the commonality that we have with one another, we can really connect in a way that we never thought possible. If we have this hospitality mindset of having empathy and kindness and acknowledgement and patience with people, we find that we can connect in the most unusual and momentary ways that can improve our lives, their lives, and lives in general. You know, Eggbach is changing the lives of students every day. It's the most fulfilling thing that I have done except raise my daughters. And I also know that I can find fulfillment every day in the things that I do. Say hello to the bus driver. Have a friendly conversation with the supermarket cashier. Walk into a room where there's a lone individual standing by themselves in a room full of chatting people and going up to that person and starting to talk to them. Please, walking through a door, turning around, seeing if there is someone behind you, and holding the door open for them. These are the little gestures that occur that are available to us every day, multiple times a day, day after day. And I think that when you start moving forward and you want to change the world, change it on a daily basis with the people who cross your path. And if you do that, the world will follow. Thank you.